uh, being implemented and integrated and, and, and how useful they are uh, in the we're hoping to be in the future and, and what sort of problems uh, they're actually addressing. Most people will know that uh, Linux is considered to be a clone of Unix originally uh, and as such it has inherited the uh, Unix security model which is referred to uh, uh, with a number of uh, different types of terminology. Um, I'll be using traditional DAC or discretionary access control. Uh, and this imposes a limit on or a constraint on what we can do in terms of uh, ongoing development and security. We have to maintain POSIX uh, compatibility. We have to make sure that old applications don't break. And uh, so it's a process of retrofitting uh, security ideas onto a, a fairly old now, I guess a 40 year old uh, design for an operating system. Okay, so this is a, a reasonably famous quote, or at least part of it is, uh, when I was um, researching for this talk, I couldn't, it took me a while to actually hunt down the origin of this uh, quote, which I think I must have read in a textbook somewhere. And uh, this is Dennis Ritchie, as everyone would know, is the, one of the designers of Unix. And in 1979, he published this paper on the security of Unix. It's quite a good paper to go and look up if you're interested in Unix security and actually design. And uh, I think it's fairly well known that uh, Unix wasn't designed with security in mind. It wasn't designed as a secure operating system. There were efforts uh, at the time, Multics and so on, where security was fairly important. Uh, but they had a different set of design goals. And what I found interesting about this quote when I dug it up was that there was a second part to it, which is not often quoted, where he said that this uh, fact alone guarantees a vast number of holes. I think it's very interesting uh, to consider, this is one of the designers of Unix, who has essentially done some analysis a few years after Unix became popular, popular and uh, made this prediction. And I think uh, that's 30 years ago now. So I think this prediction, I think there might have been a, uh, there might have been some quotes on this that, that were published from a few years earlier than this. Uh, but I think if you, if you look back, this is a fairly accurate uh, prediction. So just a bit on discretionary access control. Um, mainly on what, uh, why it's not really adequate. And uh, there's a lot to be said for the Unix uh, DAC model, it's, it was uh, very useful when uh, Unix first came out, particularly before uh, systems became widely networked uh, and before you know, networking was ubiquitous. Uh, but uh, one of the problems with discretionary access control is the discretionary nature of it. Uh, it's a, it's a basically a, a design issue in that, uh, in, uh, in simple terms, uh, it's discretionary in that a user can uh, decide what security policy is to be applied to their objects that they own and to themselves and, and to some other objects as well. So an example is if you create a file or if you run a program, you uh, have a lot of leeway over determining uh, who, who can access the file or uh, what the program actually does. Uh, so it's better than uh, no security, which is actually many people uh, would have had experience with uh, various operating systems which uh, by design didn't have uh, any kind of security built in. Um, but one of the problems as we sort of moved into the sort of internet-based world uh, that um, DAC really doesn't prevent uh, or doesn't protect against uh, software bugs from being um, exploited if there's security vulnerabilities. And it also doesn't protect against uh, malicious code and uh, people deliberately attacking the system. So from that same uh, document, uh, there was another interesting quote that I found uh, that was talking about the super user. And I guess a lot of people would think of the super user just simply as um, you know, God mode or uh, can do anything. But another way to look at it is that uh, the super user is a, a bypass of the security system. And it is by design allows uh, a user or a program to effectively uh, disable the security policy or violate the security policy. Uh, so if you're a user and you create a file and say, well, I'm going to make this uh, read only to myself. Uh, the super user obviously can, can write to it or do, do whatever they want. And uh, interestingly, 1979, 30 years ago, uh, Dennis Ritchie said that uh, just the idea of this was a theoretical uh, and usually practical blemish. And I think this speaks to a lot of the issues that have historically been found with, uh, with Unix security and Linux security. So in the 30 years or so since this, uh, these security problems were raised. I think primarily what we've seen in 
uh, general purpose operating system is just simply extending back and uh, adding more. Uh, so in Linux we have uh, a few extensions to that. Some of them are based on you know, early POSIX drafts and uh, try to maintain compatibility uh, and feature compatibility with upper other operating systems. Uh, we have a, an implementation of um, what's termed POSIX capabilities or they're also known as privileges. And this is essentially allowing a process to be flagged or have a, uh, an ability to perform some sort of uh, privileged operation at a, at a fairly high level. Um, so this, this is now extended to the file system. It used to be process only and there are people working on this to try and make uh, systems that uh, do not need set UID uh, binaries. The, there's, a, there's a few problems with this that I find and one of them is that uh, if you give somebody a capability, you, you don't necessarily know, uh, you, you can't necessarily reason about the capabilities and uh, how this privilege may be escalated and uh, what the total limits are of the of the security system. Um, so, for example, if you can uh, give somebody uh, CAP sysadmin, which is a uh, very commonly um, implemented capability in the code, uh, once they have that, it's quite possible they have all the other capabilities. And if you grep through the source code, it's very difficult to reason uh, and make uh, you know, decisions or understanding about uh, once you get one capability, then what can you do with that? Uh, capabilities also don't take into account the security attributes of the object. It's just of the subject. Yeah, about uh, so the question is. Well, theoretically, yes, there's a, a bounding set for the capabilities for that particular process, but. To understand the behaviour of the system uh, as a whole, it's quite difficult to look at how all these processes then interact and how they communicate uh, through objects. So, th I mean, there are people working on it and um, on this, trying to make these set UID free uh, systems. So, we, we might see something uh, come out of that. Uh, we also have uh, a POSIX ACLS implementation based again on, on an old uh, POSIX discussion. And this essentially takes the uh, abbreviated uh, ACLs that Unix ships as a, as a traditional security mechanism and just generalizes those. And, uh, there's several different types of ACLs around uh, and Linux is uh, one, one flavor that is, is, is based on the POSIX spec. Uh, it's fairly incompatible with, say, the Windows ACLs and uh, NT, uh, NFS version 4 ACLs are a whole uh, different scheme as well. So Linux also has the concept of uh, resource namespaces and uh, this was derived from uh, ideas in Plan 9 where uh, every, uh, every subject on the system uh, has its own namespace, its own file system namespace and this was introduced by Al Vero, one of the core kernel developers for Linux and uh, it basically by default gives you a completely private view of uh, a file system namespace. So you, you basically you can't interact with anything. So there's a saying in uh, computer security that you know, isolation is easy, sharing is hard, and that's essentially what the problem was with that initially. And it wasn't until fairly recently that uh, it was made more useful uh, by being able to implement controlled sharing between uh, systems in different namespaces. So for example, uh, in uh, Fedora, we have something called kiosk mode, which integrates a whole uh, set of uh, security features. And uh, one of the applications here is to give the, an anonymous user uh, a private home directory that only they can see, private temporary directories, and then uh, the root file system is mounted read-only so that they can access you know, shared libraries and so on in a, in a read-only way. And this is essentially uh, based on the, namespace, the initial namespace idea. And this is uh, in Linux is integrated with PAM, the pluggable authentication modules, which I believe was originally from Solaris or SunOS. And uh, there, if you want to see all of this sort of in action together, uh, if you install Fedora 11 and install the xGuest package, you can log in as a guest, which is a, a uh, an unauthenticated user. And all of these uh, techniques are used to protect the system from this user.
There are a number of uh, network access control features in the kernel. Uh, NetFilter is uh, probably the most well known. It was developed primarily by an Australian, Rusty Russell, uh, and was, a, I think, the third generation of, of packet filtering uh, in the Linux kernel. And I was uh, on the original core team for that, so I think for some reason there's a lot of Australians interested in uh, packet filtering development. And NetFilter itself is essentially an API in the kernel and it is a generic layer three uh, framework for intercepting packets as they traverse uh, certain, you know, certain behaviors within the kernel. So you can, uh, for a given protocol, register a kernel application which says, well, give me all of the IPv4 packets which are coming into this box and not going anywhere else will give me all the packets that are being forwarded and so on. Uh, so this then allows some uh, fairly sophisticated higher level uh, thinking to go on without worrying about ever having to think about you know, where you're poking around inside the kernel to grab packets from. And IP tables is probably the most well known um, net filter application, which is the, you know, the default uh, packet filtering framework for Linux. And uh, IPv4 and IPv6 are supported. Uh, there's also connection tracking, which is also referred to a stateful inspection and uh, it has a pluggable framework so that uh, different protocol uh, helpers, so for FTP and so on, which have uh, complicated behaviour, this can be actually built in and you don't have to write rules which try and uh, understand all the different connections uh, that an FTP uh, session might make. And uh, we also have uh, network ad address translation uh, built into the same framework here. And there are, there are actually hundreds of um, modules which have been added and many of them are upstream. Some of them don't ever quite make it upstream for reasons of taste, uh, but it's a, it's a fairly extensible system. And I'm not sure if, I think somebody's working on another one. I, I so these, this is, so far I've been talking mainly about uh, traditional or you know, commonly understood security mechanisms which are integrated into the Linux kernel. Um, there is another school of thought about these types of mechanisms and there's a very important paper for people interested in uh, computer security. Uh, and by the way, I've got about three slides worth of links and URLs at the end of this, so when you download the slides after the, uh, the conference, uh, you'll be able, you, you can either Google these, these papers or you can uh, just grab the slides and, and copy the, the URLs out of the slides. Um, so if I mention a paper, it's, it's most likely in the, in the uh, resources. Uh, the US National Security Agency published a paper called uh, The Inevi Inevitability of Failure. Uh, that's the short version of the title. And what they did, they took all of their uh, understanding and their research they'd been undertaking uh, over a couple of decades and uh, that they'd been applying to research operating systems and uh, kind of distilled out some requirements for um, ensuring that you have a, uh, an, an appropriate level of robustness and assurance in computer systems, um, you know, in a, in a sort of uh, globally networked environment uh, for the general case, not just for military use and, and government use. So this paper is worth reading on its own. I'll just uh, summarise the three main uh, points that they mentioned that are required to uh, to to meet you know modern security requirements. And one of these is mandatory security. And this encompasses mandatory access control. Um, and the idea here is to move away from discretionary security where uh, processes, uh, subjects can actually control their own uh, security um, policy. It also encompasses things like, um, it's not just mandatory access control or MAC as it's referred to in security terms, uh, it's, or in the security uh, community. It also would include and encompass uh, things like uh, mandatory uh, cryptographic protection. So you have policies saying, well, if you've got uh, objects or, or data of a, of a certain, you know, of certain characteristics, then you have a certain uh, amount of uh, cryptographic protection is applied to it on disk, and then a certain type of cryptographic protection is applied when you transfer it over the network. Uh, so it includes that, and it also includes uh, mandatory in integrity. Um, and we're seeing this coming in now with TPM and uh, platform security and, and also some other, some other um, technologies which I'll get onto a bit later. Uh, the second um, requirement is for trusted path. 
and uh, trusted path is, a, is a, in, in simple terms, uh, you could illustrate trusted path by thinking about logging into a Unix terminal at a, like a login prompt and wanting to know that you're actually logging in and you're actually talking to the bin login program or wherever it's located and not an application that the previous user uh, has got there running to sniff your password. Um, so in this paper, they talk about generalizing this to um, something called the protected path, <coughs> which is to take this idea and talk about having uh, all processing endpoints in the system have uh, mutually authenticated channels. So uh, when you're logging in, you know that you're talking to a, a valid um, program that is supposed to be getting your password, but also that the, uh, this program knows that it's talking to a real user and it's talking to the correct user and also that these communications are protected from uh, eavesdropping. And they also then talk about something called the network protected path, which uh, when this was published seemed fairly esoteric, but now with you know, cloud computing and the distributed environment, uh, extending these ideas and these protections, uh, uh, you know, if you have a web, a web application server, you've got you know, rendering front end, you might have applications at, at various tiers and you've got uh, databases and so on. Uh, so to be able to protect these pathways between these systems and they, they, they can now be spread out sort of all over the internet. Uh, so that's one aspect. And an, another one and, and probably the most difficult one is assurance. And this is basically how, you, how confident you can be that the system is doing uh, what you want it to do and that it's actually meeting the requirements that you need it to meet. And uh, this is a very difficult area and uh, some people might think that it only includes things like certifications, government certifications, that's part of it, but assurance is also things like um, just having best practices, um, you know, having um, auditing of what you're doing, uh, having QA and staging systems before you release them. And it can be basically anything that in increases that confidence level. Um, and one aspect of assurance, I'm not sure if it's mentioned in the paper, is open source, and I think open source increases uh, computer security assurance. Um, not simply through having access to the source code, although that certainly helps, but um, there was a, on one of the uh, crypto mailing lists recently, somebody was talking about a Mac application, which I think was for storing, um, like a, for storing different passwords and, and passphrases. And uh, someone mentioned, well, it looks really nice, except they can't go and look and just do a basic sanity check on the source code to see if uh, mlock is being used to lock, make sure that um, you know, your password and uh, sensitive information can't be swapped out to disk and so on. And so uh, having the source code at least lets you perform some sanity checks and uh, understand uh, what the programmer was thinking about. Have they read any books on secure programming? And of course, it doesn't prove anything. It doesn't prove that um, this, the underlying system call is actually doing what you think it's doing. Uh, but again, you, you then have an assurance for, for, the, for the system as well. So in a way, without even really realising it, uh, especially with the implementation of SE Linux, Security Enhanced Linux, which is their project, um, which I've spent a lot of time working on in the last few years, I, I think in Linux we're starting to uh, get towards meeting these requirements, uh, certainly much more than when this paper was published uh, 10 years ago. So in part of uh, the protections that are required to, to help meet these requirements is uh, a need for a strong cryptography. And unfortunately in Linux we got a, off to a bit of a slow start, uh, largely due to the US uh, export restrictions which were in effect uh, until, which I can't remember the exact date, but effectively we didn't really have strong crypto in the kernel until about 2002. Um, there were some external projects which uh, integrated crypto, although uh, in Linux, and I'm, I'm assuming this would be similar in other uh, open source projects, if it's not really upstream, it's not, not really part of the project. And we were allowed to use uh, hashing. Um, how did I stop that from happening? We were allowed to, to use hashing, and uh, we had a, a random number generator uh, because this is uh, not considered um, an export risk. Uh, those regulations changed, and then you know, a decision was taken by Linus to uh, allow crypto into the kernel so that it uh, could be distributed out uh, to the general uh, population. Um, and this is primarily at the time to support IPsec. And I, I worked on that in my spare time in about uh, five weeks or so from, from when I got some emails from some of the developers. Uh, so that was really to get it in under the door for the 2.6 uh, 
kernel release. Uh, the initial uh, kernel crypto was fairly basic. As a result, it was uh, synchronous. Uh, you had to basically wait until the crypto operation finished. Um, there wasn't any support for crypto hardware. And Herbert Zhu, another Australian, has uh, now taken over, uh, taken leadership of this project of the crypto, and uh, a lot of these um, features have now been integrated. So apart from IPsec, as I mentioned, one of the um, main uses of crypt cryptography in the kernel is uh, disk encryption. And being Linux, we have uh, many ways to do this. So I'll just mention the two primary uh, disk crypto schemes which are used. And this is the one that's used by Fedora, which is the, the distribution that I, I work on. Uh, it's called DMcrypt. DM is uh, the device mapper, and that's our block layer uh, plug-in um, scheme. So uh, anything that needs to be done with the block layer that uh, is um, you know, an extension of the kernel can be plugged in there. We have software RAID, device mirroring, um, logical volume management partially occurs there. And crypto is, um, if you put crypto there, then you can have you know, entire device encryption. And this is um, installed now and selected as a default in Fedora when you install it and you can unselect it if you don't really trust it. Uh, and it has a fairly sophisticated uh, key management system in user space called uh, Luke's, I think is how it's pronounced. So if you want to get an idea of what this is like, just uh, grab a recent version of Fedora and you can, uh, you can, you can try it out fairly easily. Uh, the other major disk encryption technology uh, in the kernel is uh, EcryptFS, Ecrypt and this is uh, developed by people at IBM, and, uh, or partially developed by people at IBM. And rather than working at the block layer, this works at the DFS layer, the virtual file system layer. And this then allows for per object encryption. So you can encrypt files separately, then you can back them up and then restore them to a different machine and then each file can be uh, recovered. And uh, that's got a fairly extensible uh, key management system. And uh, so if, if you, if you want to do entire simple block encryption, you use de-encrypt. And if you want to just encrypt a few files, such as you know, your um, .ssh files, uh, then you, you would look at using this. And particularly if you wanted to uh, get them back in case of a, a disk crash. Also I mentioned IPsec, but I'll just mention a couple of uh, issues or a couple of characteristics of the Linux implementation. Um, if IPsec in Linux is implemented using a generic pluggable framework or a stackable framework uh, where it, uh, you can apply a packet selector, you can basically insert policy into the kernel to select packets and then apply a stack of transforms or xforms. And this is uh, very similar to the IPsec uh, specifications for those who are familiar with those and this is the security policy uh, database. And some of the transforms include the uh, IPsec protocols, ESP, AH, IPcomp. And this is also where now we do IP and IP uh, tunneling, uh, mobile IP and so on can be used. So if uh, you're looking at doing any development on customising the network stack uh, or research, then this is an interesting area to, to look at uh, to, as, a, as, a, as a way of basically wading into the networking without having to understand everything. Uh, we also have native um, netlink sockets, which are based, I believe, on the BSD routing socket and this is a user kernel communication scheme uh, which is used for uh, basically improving the, the performance of communicating data between the user and kernel space. Uh, so for, to meet the, with the spe IV6 specifications, uh, we have to implement PFP. So if you have portable applications, you can use PFP. Uh, but if you have uh, really high performance uh, requirements or scalability requirements, you probably want to use the NetLink interface and the, uh, some high level high end appliances are using this stack that you know support tens of thousands of VPN connections and uh, definitely we have to be using the, uh, the netlink based sockets there for dumping out uh, various kernel databases okay so memory protection is a is probably the kind of hot area at the moment in uh, security we've done a lot of work in you know putting barriers around um, 
and, and building fences around the operating system. Uh, but probably some of the some of the more recent uh, areas of sort of fruitful uh, exploration by uh, the, the the attack based community is in memory protection and things like uh, traditionally stack overflows and attacking uh, applications and even attacking the kernel itself. And this is actually a very complicated area. It's an area that I'm not an expert in. So, uh, and also it, it covers a lot of areas. It's not just the kernel. So uh, this, is a, this is definitely something if you're interested in, then um, there's some resources in, in, I've left in the end of the slides to get more information. Uh, but at a kernel level, we support things like the no execute bit, which is available in, in uh, more recent um, CPUs. Uh, we're emulating this, and we got some of the code from this from um, I think it was PAX. Uh, the PAX, there's, there's several uh, hardened Linux projects which do things which may not be acceptable in the upstream kernel. So we try and get what we can from those projects. Um, and there's also uh, support for um, you know, randomizing libraries and randomizing the address layout of where uh, symbols might be located in, in, in memory. Uh, there's also protections in the compiler. And we also have protections and um, some partially successful um, ways of trying to protect some of the attacks against the kernel. And we also, in SE Linux, which I'll get into get onto a, a, in a few slides, uh, we can use uh, security policy to determine which applications might be able to do some otherwise uh, dangerous looking things uh, with, with the memory. So for example, if you had a virtual machine like a Java VM that needed to uh, make memory, uh, its own memory executable and then run uh, untrusted code in there, then under mandatory access control policy under SE Linux, we can actually decide, well, this application can do this, but uh, we don't really trust anyone else to do that. And something to mention as well, if uh, somebody does get into a kernel, then it's game over for any of these kernel protection mechanisms. Um, if people are interested in looking in, into uh, what we're trying to defend against and, and, and the kinds of uh, the level of sophistication just in the published um, attacks, there's uh, the, the latest version of FRAC has a, has a very lengthy article and detailed article on attacking the kernel. Uh, it's quite a, quite a difficult area to actually um, protect against. So some people may have heard of LSM or the Linux Security Modules project, possibly because of some of the flame wars and the, the press that it's generated uh, over the years. Uh, LSM is a, a, an access control um, framework for plugging in different types of access control models. And LSM came about because the NSA went and um, developed SE Linux as a kernel patch, and they wanted to put that into the kernel as the um, for extended security mechanism. And uh, there was no consensus in the community at the time, and there hasn't been since, on whether this is the right thing to do or not. So Linus came back and said, we'll just make it all pluggable. And this is basically where LSM came from. So most of the developers who were involved in that, uh, including this is where I became involved in this, was, uh, were involved in developing this um, framework. I believe BSD has got something similar. It's got a, a Mac framework for integrating different access control schemes into the kernel. And one of the um, defining characteristics of this is that it uses hook points in the kernel rather than trying to, say, um, interpose at the system call layer or, or uh, other techniques. It actually goes and puts hooks wherever a security relevant decision is being made. And uh, this is important to avoid races so that you have all of the information that you need and you know that uh, it's been copied from user space and can't be modified, for example. And uh, Robert Watson, who people may be familiar with from the BSD project, uh, has written important, an important paper on this subject about uh, syscall wrappers. And again, that's referenced uh, at the end. And uh, it is believed that LSM and also the, the trusted BSD or the BSD Mac framework take the, um, take the best approach here in terms of avoiding known problems with, with adding, you know, bolting security mechanisms into kernels. Uh, it's also a... Uh, restrictive interface in that it doesn't commit any new accesses. So uh, theoretically, well, by design, you, you can't uh, give away any more access than uh, was already uh, being uh, provided. 
and also it is, uh, allows the discretionary access control decisions to occur first. So uh, before the MAC uh, code is, is um, called at all, if you weren't able to use your normal Unix permissions, then um, that will fail out as, as expected. And that helps to maintain uh, sanity, number one, and also helps to stop applications from crashing and uh, makes the system um, a, as close to what's expected as possible. There are several uh, LSM uh, projects. The, the, most, the one that's probably had the most development and uh, the most deployment is SE Linux. And uh, in a nutshell, SE Linux provides uh, generalized, fine-grained, mandatory access control. It came out of some research projects. The initial, uh, some of the initial um, ideas behind this came from the 80s, from uh, research that was done into uh, addressing flaws and, and drawbacks that they were actually finding in military uh, security systems as far back as the 70s that they were fielding. Uh, and so this idea of generalizing the, the security mechanisms so that you're not, you're not hard coding the security logic in came about then. In the 90s, there was some uh, research projects where these ideas were tested out. One of them was at the University of Utah. There was the uh, Flux operating system project. And the NSA and some uh, researchers worked on uh, something called Flask or the Flask security model, which was integrated into uh, this microkernel operating system. And so SE Linux essentially was the results of that and the technical reports from that uh, were transferred out like a technology transfer into the sort of mainstream through open source, which um, yeah, there, there were other models for doing this, but I think this is a, a fairly uh, interesting development in, in the history of computer security. Um, and the main thing that SE Linux does and, and does for you as a, in terms of general use is that it is used for containing uh, exploits and vulnerabilities. So if you had, say, a web server that's uh, listening on the open internet and there's a, a bug in the PHP code uh, or the PHP application that it's running, then SE Linux doesn't actually stop that bug from being there and doesn't stop it necessarily from being exploited. Uh, the idea is to try and contain the damage. So once you get into the web server, then hopefully it's not able to then be used to send um, email and become a, a spam zombie. Uh, it does quite a lot of other things. It's uh, being used. Uh, it, has a, a, it allows different security models to be plugged in such as multi-level security, which is a requirement for dealing with classified information. And um, that's been adapted to something called MCS, which we use um, just a subset of that. And that's allowed us to have the MLS code uh, switched on and enabled uh, by default in Fedora and uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Um, and yeah, so some of, some of the, the benefits of this approach and, and the design here are uh, the ability to meet a wide range of security requirements, so it's been certified and it's been used uh, by various governments and, and, and military users, but it's also been used by hundreds of thousands or possibly millions of um, people just running Fedora who don't even know it's there. We have about a, as far as we can tell, uh, we have about a 70% compliance rate of people leaving SE Linux enabled from the stats that we get back, um, which is higher than what most people uh, think. Generally speaking, most people who switch it off are the power users who are doing strange things to their system. Um, but a lot of people just leave it on. They don't realize it's running because uh, they don't try and do strange things to their system. And that compliance rate is uh, comparable to... Um, well, firstly, I, I did some research to try and find out other types of security mechanisms and, and wh how often people use them. And I found that in the state of uh, New Hampshire in the US that the compliance rate for people wearing seatbelts is about 70%. And they don't have a, an adult seatbelt law. So I'm thinking if we can get a similar compliance rate to you know, people putting seatbelts on, which are established for 50, 60 years and say actually saving lives, then um, you know, it's, yeah, maybe, maybe we're not doing so badly with that. Uh, one of the other LSM applications, which is uh, more recent, it's called, uh, it's called SMAC, and that was developed by someone, uh, Casey Schaeffler, who worked on the uh, trusted IREX code and uh, uh, what you have somebody who you would refer to as a, a grey beard, although he doesn't have a, have a beard. Um, 
And it is very simple and it is uh, probably useful for studying mandatory access control. It's, it's in the upstream kernel and you can, you can get it out and understand it. Probably in about an hour of reading the papers and having a look at the code, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite an elegant scheme and obviously Casey knows what he's doing there. That's, that's yet to be uh, established as, as you know, in deployments, um, but it, you know, it, it looks like you can do some useful things with that. Um, AppArmor is a security model that was developed uh, and put forward around the same time as SE Linux. There's been a sort of a lot of historical controversy over this. Uh, five so basically, uh, that controversy is, is essentially over. The path name hooks uh, for its security model have been merged upstream, and it's really just a matter of the developers now uh, putting that code forward for a review. And uh, they use um, try and simplify security by providing what they call natural abstractions to, um, to the policy so that people are more familiar with um, managing path names um, and that, that's how the security uh, policy at a, at a fundamental level is uh, implemented. And also uh, another path name security model has been merged upstream. Uh, it's a Japanese uh, research um, project called Tomoyo and it is aimed at uh, non-technical users, people, and specifically at not having to write security policy or understand security. And it uses a form of learning mode to try and understand what the application is supposed to do and then you roll it out. Okay, we also have some uh, frameworks for applying mandatory access control to networking. We've resurrected SIPSO, which is using uh, putting security labels in IP options. Uh, there's also uh, labeling of IPsec security associations which gives you built-in uh, protection, you know, cryptographic protection, and uh, this act, that actually came out of the class research as well. We're also utilising uh, the IP tables uh, framework to do local uh, marking of packets with security labels. Uh, so you can, might say, well, anything coming on this interface, which I trust and I can see it, I'm going to uh, give it a certain security label and treat those packets separately in the kernel. Uh, we're also extending uh, labeled security support to NFS, and there's a kind of a large effort on at the moment to uh, extend the NFS version 4 uh, protocol with, through the IETF and it requires changes to the RPC security, uh, RPC security code and uh, specification. So the code's essentially written on that. We just need to get through two IETF working groups, uh, which is fun. We also have uh, ACLs over NFS and if anyone, anyone was L at LCA, they would have seen Greg Banks from uh, what was SGI in Melbourne. Uh, talk on this. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, then definitely look at his slides and I've, I've referenced those as well. Um, and another area in meeting these um, requirements for integrity, uh, as outlined initially, um, is to utilise hardware protection to try and protect against attacks against the kernel itself. And uh, you know, one particularly interesting area here is the uh, TXT um, or the grand technology from Intel. And there's some interesting projects going on here which use virtualization and uh, to do runtime verification of the kernel that you're running uh, using uh, hardware to, um, to store the measurements and to, to, to refer to, to measurements, to known measurements. And where this gets interesting is this so-called dynamic root of trust measurement, which means you can bring up an untrusted um, so you can bring up a trusted uh, and verified, say, virtual machine on an untrusted base. You don't need to measure everything leading up to that. Uh, otherwise, if you have to measure everything leading up to that point, one change in your bootloader or something means you've really got to load a new uh, security fingerprint into the, into the hardware. And there's also, I think, uh, Sherry mentioned the IO MMU this morning uh, with the Spark hardware. Uh, PCs are getting this too, and that's the important security mechanism. Got audit. Uh, which was required for the certification process. Um, I don't know that many people who are all that fond of audit, but it is uh, potentially useful in integrating with uh, intrusion detection systems. Okay, so in the future, what I, I would be expecting, that uh, we would just be continuing to do what we've been doing, uh, and that is to continue to retrofit new ideas into the system. Uh, we can't really, we don't have the luxury of designing a secure operating system from the ground up. Um, there are people doing that and 
Uh, so, you know, if, if they come up with ideas that we can adapt, we'll, we'll definitely look at those. And I think, you know, one of the, the core aspects of uh, Linux kernel security is that in most of these areas, there's always review that comes back and says, well, let's make this extensible and make it uh, generic and pluggable. And as you can see with things like NetFilter and LSM and the crypto uh, framework, you can, uh, you can do that. And I think that's part of the key to meeting future requirements is building the flexibility in, uh, from the beginning, which is uh, partly what we're doing. Um, and in terms of challenges, I guess there are two main things that I see, and one is that we have uh, so many different security models. Uh, it's not standard between different flavors of Unix, uh, Linux. Uh, so some effort needs to go into maybe building some higher level abstractions uh, for ISVs and application developers. And also I think trying to convince people uh, that to leave security enabled and to make use of it. And uh, you know, there's still a lot of people who switch off the firewalling that's built in and they also do all the development as root. And um, you know, there's, there's a certain classes of users you'll never convince to use any kind of security. Uh, but in terms of trying to find like some sweet spot for you know, the general user population. We're hoping that's really where we're aiming. Okay, so in terms of resources, uh, probably the LWN Linux Weekly News security page is, is a really good place to look. Uh, if you want to do any development or follow the development, the Linux security module mailing list is now sort of morphed into the Linux kernel security mailing list. And there's also a wiki which you can fairly easily Google. And these are the resources which don't try and read them on the screen. Thank you. Thanks.